In this video, I want to talk about reference priors, which were created by Bernardo as an attempt to form uninformative priors. And the idea with reference priors is that you would choose your, your prior, P of theta, to maximize some form of discrepancy between the prior and the posterior, which I'm going to write P of theta given T here, where T is a sufficient statistic. And a sufficient statistic, if you don't know what that is, essentially it's a sample statistic which tells you as much about the data generating process as would be the case if you had the entire sample of raw data. And just assuming we have a summary statistic here just makes the ensuing discussion slightly easier, although it's not really changed if instead you consider just having the data itself. So what sort of measure of discrepancy should we use to quantify the difference between the prior and the posterior? Well, perhaps the most logical quantity to use to, to measure this discrepancy would be the information theoretic quantity which we spoke about before, which is the callback Leibler divergence. And here we're going to calculate the divergence between of going from the posterior to the prior. And if we do so, that's just an integral of P of theta given T, the posterior, times the log of P of theta given T, the posterior, divided through by the prior, p of theta. And we're integrating with respect to theta across all ranges of theta. And so the idea here is that we would be picking our prior to maximize our value that we obtain for the callback Leibler divergence. So what actually is the motivation for maximizing the discrepancy between the prior and the posterior? Well, the idea is that if the posterior looks nothing like the prior, then presumably the posterior is reflecting the data rather than the prior. And hence, in some senses, our priors are having the least possible effect they can do on our inferences. And so just to sort of give you a bit of a feel for how the callback Leibler divergence kind of works, if our posterior actually equals our prior, then this whole sort of term here equals one, and hence the log of one is zero, and hence the callback Leibler divergence is zero. So if, in the event that our prior equals our posterior, we get a minimum value of the callback Leibler divergence, which is equal to zero. For all other priors, the callback Leibler divergence is greater than zero. But hang on a second, doesn't this mean that essentially what we're gonna be doing is calculating a posterior and then working backwards towards our prior. And that doesn't seem like it's a, the right thing to do because essentially we're using our data to inform what our prior is. Instead, what Bernardo said we should do was to maximize, before we obtain the data, the expected callback Leibler divergence. So when, when we're saying expected here, I mean the expected value with respect to the distribution on T, the summary statistic. And to calculate this, all we do is we integrate with respect to the distribution of the summary statistic our callback Leibler divergence in terms of, well, it's defined in terms of the posterior and the prior. And so we're integrating with respect to T here. So then the idea here is that we can replace this term, the callback Leibler divergence, with what we had before. And then what we obtain is P of T times the integral of P of theta given T times the log of P of theta given T over P of theta, integrated now with respect to theta and T. And again, we're integrating across the entire range of theta and the entire range of T. But we can simplify this somewhat if we move the P of T inside the second integral. So all we obtain now is P of theta 
given t times p of t times the log of p of theta given t over p of theta. I know this looks very mathematical, but we're getting there, I promise. And then what we notice is that this product here is just the joint distribution of theta and t. Because remember, the conditional law of probability says that p of theta given t is equal to the joint p of theta and t over p of t, which we can rearrange to obtain what I've written below. Similarly, we can use the law of conditional probability to rewrite this term as p of theta and t, the joint distribution, divided through by p of t. And what that gives us overall now, we have two integrals, both of them between minus infinity and infinity, but I'm not going to write them. And we're going to have p of theta and t, the joint distribution, times the log of p of theta and t over p of theta times p of t, integrated with respect to theta and t. Okay, so why have I done all this sort of manipulation here? Well, the idea is that this quantity actually has a meaning. This is what's known as the mutual information between theta and t. And what the mutual information is, is it's a measure of dependence between the two variables. If theta and t are independent, then the numerator of this expression just becomes p of theta times p of t, which exactly cancels with the denominator, meaning that you get log of 1. In other words, the mutual information is 0. And that makes sense, because if the variables are independent, then there's no joint information between them. In other words, knowing the value of one of the variables does not help you predict the value of the other one, and hence the mutual information is 0. And so the idea here is that what we're going to try and do is we're going to construct a prior which maximizes the mutual information between theta and t. So why is that something that we want to do? Well, the idea is that if we can maximize the dependence between theta and t, then essentially we are aligning the information from our data, which is, is given by t, described by t here, and the information in our prior. And because we are aligning those two things, that means that we are giving our data the maximum possible capacity to influence our posterior distribution. So just to represent that diagrammatically, suppose we chose a prior which was basically independent of our distribution for our data. In that case, our sort of contour plot between these two variables would look something like that which I'm drawing now. And so there's very little correlation between these two variables. And what that means is that the prior is going to convey to our posterior different information to that which is in our sample. And because of that, our prior is going to influence our posterior. Suppose by contrast we had a strong correlation, it can be positive, it can be negative, between theta and t. So in other words, our prior is very much aligned with our distribution over t, then the idea is that basically these two variables are telling us kind of the same thing. And our prior, because it's aligning with our data distribution, means that it's actually not going to influence the posterior much. Basically, all of the influence on the posterior is going to be governed by our summary statistic. So, in summary, reference priors are a way of maximizing the discrepancy between the prior and the posterior. And the discrepancy that they use is the callback Leibler divergence. And if you work through the maths, essentially maximizing the callback Leibler divergence between the prior and the posterior is the same thing as maximizing the mutual information between the prior and our data distribution. And so the idea is that if we choose a prior that maximizes the mutual information between the prior and our data distribution, then in a sense, we are not allowing our prior to exert much of an influence on our posterior, or in other words, an influence which is considerably different to that which is dictated by our sample. Whilst this is a really interesting concept, in practice, reference priors aren't really used that much these days. 
And the reasons for that are, are many, but one of them is the mathematical difficulty in constructing them. Remember that we have to do these kind of integrals and for higher dimensional cases, that's just basically intractable. And also, as I've tried to stress in other videos, I think that these sort of methods are kind of missing the point by trying to make analysis objective. There is no true objective analysis and we would be better, in my view, just to accept that and kind of move on. But anyway, it's still useful to know about these concepts in case you encounter them in the literature.